inside the Borg, and free from the hive mind, this is Rex Bear, hosting Leap Project. The Leap Project was created to offer awareness and information not found in the mainstream news. With over 90% of the world's media controlled by only six enormous conglomerates, many people today are looking for more accurate information. The Leap Project offers a refreshing approach to the brain drain media. Check back daily for new content as we thrive to bring you the cutting edge in news, current events, on scene video footage, interviews, and most importantly, the truth. We've spoken many times before, Dr. Brown. We've talked about some amazing space anomalies, and Iapetus is definitely one of the most fascinating satellites that I've had the opportunity to see. There's so many correlations with the Death Star in Star Wars, Return of the Jedi, Empire Strikes Back, that even the same blast sites correlate with the photographs. So you, being the leader and running the Farsight Institute, one of the most prestigious remote viewing institutes in the world, and having access to so much valid information. Yeah, it was a, a real great enigma for us because great many years ago, I was interested in another project that somehow wrapped Iapetus into it, and that started my strong interest in Iapetus. And that was the project that we did many years ago at the Farsight Institute on the origin of the asteroid belt. Now, the asteroid belt, the mainstream science explanation for it, is that it was created by the primordial solar nebula, which had a lot of junk that was left over, and it just condensed, and there was the asteroid belt. Now, that doesn't have a shred of evidence to support it. It's just a complete out-of-the-clear-blue-sky set of ideas. And the alternate hypothesis is that it was created by a planet that was once there that exploded. Now, the reason the primordial nebula idea is so supported is that mainstream astronomers don't want to think about the idea that a planet could explode. So they support this solar nebula hypothesis and come up with all types of convoluted logic for how it happened. But in reality, there's not a shred of evidence to support it. And the logic is as crazy as you can think about it. Because, for example, the asteroids are made of these huge rocks, like the Ceres asteroid. I mean, they're huge, huge, huge rocks. You need a gravity well, a, a gravity source to pull a lot of dust together to produce a rock. You can't get a solid big rock out of a lot of dust that's colliding in space from the primordial, primordial solar nebula. It has to condense first into a gravity well with a lot of pressure. And then also the rocks themselves, the asteroids, have evidence that they have been exposed to a tremendous amount of heat, a lot of surface glazing, melting. So... Thomas Van Flandern, uh, former head of his Department of Celestial, Manca Celestial Mechanics at the Naval Observatory, amassed a huge amount of planetary data supporting the exploding planet hypothesis, while mainstream science was supporting this crazy primordial solar nebula idea. And so we did a test with remote viewing using two different methodologies. That's controlled remote viewing. Uh, that's a formal methodology that taught by people like Lynn Buchanan, uh, and that came out, that, uh, the methodology came out of uh, the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, an official program in the U.S. military. And then we also used uh, remote viewers that were working with the Hawaii Remote Viewers Guild, led by Glenn Weechan, who came out of special forces. And that method of remote viewing was uh, not out of an official program, but rather a movement within the military that later became known as the 1st Earth Battalion and was featured in the movie uh, Men Who Stare at Goats, starring Jeff Bridges and George Clooney. So we had these two different methodologies, a lot of remote viewers, and all of the remote viewing data under totally blind conditions. They were just told there was a target, remote view it, that supported the idea that there was a planet that exploded. Now, how did this wrap in Iapetus? Well, if there was a planet that exploded, one of the thoughts that Thomas Van Flandern had was that this big, dark splotch on the side of Iapetus was caused by a debris wave that traveled throughout the solar system when that planet exploded. And the debris wave hit Iapetus. Iapetus is a white, icy moon, and it's tidally locked, so it does not spin when it, when it orbits Saturn. It's, 
so it would have been held steady as the debris wave passed it, leaving a dark splotch. Now, mainstream science has a couple of ideas about how that dark splotch came about, all of which are like dancing on the head of a pin. The logic is so convoluted, it's hard to begin. But the debris wave is very straightforward, and that's what Thomas Van Flandern thought, and so we included that in the asteroid origin of the asteroid belt project. And sure enough, the debris wave was caused by the exploding planet that blew up and this debris wave hit Iapetus, and that's what caused the dark splotch. So that was my original interest in Iapetus. And then also many years ago, I was looking at Iapetus pictures that were available on the Internet, and some people on the Internet had uh, pointed out this strange thing on the side of a crater. And I looked closely at it, and I said, wow, that sure looks like a set of buildings. They had curved walls. Uh, it had two. It had a, a bunch of very similar buildings, one after the other, and they had a flat circular top, uh, smooth sides that are curved, and what looked like steps coming out of the side uh, with a right angle to them. And they were way too big, far too big to actually be steps, but they looked like steps. So whatever they were, were artificial, it seems, from the picture. And this is a picture that was taken by the Cassini space probe sent up by NASA. And it's still there, orbiting Saturn to this day, taking pictures. Now, there are much higher resolution pictures. They don't release those to the public. Uh, U.S. space satellites, for example, spy satellites have, have long been... What's that? No, I, I have not seen it. I was just wondering if you've had the opportunity to see those high no, resolution I, I, photos. I don't have those. I don't have access to those pictures. But I know they exist because space spy satellites can have long, have, many, have a great many decades, been able to read the label on a baseball from hundreds of miles in space. So the, right. the resolution is, is quite clear from those cameras. And, but nonetheless, the ones that they did release to the public are, you know, were good enough to see this thing. So I said to myself many years ago that I would like to examine what that is if ever given a chance. And so, well... It's a strange story because the remote viewers that I work with now are predominantly the very best on the planet. People like Dick Algaier, who came out of the Hawaii Remote Viewers Guild using the HRVG method, and Daz Smith, who uses the CRV method, coming that uh, came out of the, the Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA. And uh, those people really have a desire and interest in getting their art form accepted by mainstream. And they've often not wanted to add extra woo-woo elements to it, such as extra extraterrestrial targets. So I often avoided extraterrestrial targets for many years. But this is an opportunity where I sort of said, well, this is this has got to, i got to break this eventually. So eventually I just told them, we have a new project, do it. They did it under totally blind conditions, not expecting anything extraterrestrial. And I included three extraterrestrial targets in one project. And the first one was the so-called base on Mars in Cydonia. And that was really interesting because we figured out what that whole thing was. And the second target was this anomaly, this thing that looked like a facility or set of structures on the inside wall of a crater of Iapetus, which was very clear on the pictures. And the third one was the Phoenix Lights, the famous incident of the Phoenix Lights. And that will be coming out in video form in um, July. But the Iapetus one is like fresh off the presses. It's only been out a week. And that's really tremendously uh, tremendously interesting from our, from our perspective. So that's how I got interested in this. And uh, the I, we, we found out now what that facility is. And it was the biggest surprise to all of us. You see, with something like a space facility... Normally, you think of an extraterrestrial spy base, a uh, military facility. Uh, perhaps you think in terms of a mining operation. But this was none of that. This was something I've never heard anybody talk about ever. This was the craziest thing we'd ever experienced. And no, and no one could have predicted it. No one could have planned it. And you really have to see the remote viewing yourself to appreciate how amazing and weird this thing is so what we do now is for the last for quite a few years now 
we don't do paper and pen sessions anymore like they used in the military. Uh, we use those basically just for warm-up exercises. But we do all of the remote viewing standing up, live, recorded on video. And so Daz Smith and Dick Elgar were totally blind. They were in their own homes, uh, setting up their own camera equipment, their own audio equipment. And we've gotten really good at producing really first-rate videos about this so the audience can actually see the remote viewing going live. And the remote viewers had to learn not only how to do it standing up in front of whiteboards, but how to do it in a theatrically engaging, interactive manner. And they are spectacular. Uh, Daz Smith and Dick Elgeyer are one of a kind, and to be able to work with them is just unbelievable. So they did all of that, and they came in with pretty much duplicate data because they're both that good. Their data always corroborate one another, and they don't have any communication between them during the time that the remote viewing is going on, and the only thing they were ever told is a non-leading email saying that there is a target and they should remote view it. So it's amazing how accurate these data are. So there are there are verifiable elements, and then there are new elements for this target. So for this target, the thing, we have a nice picture of it. Uh, the verifiable elements is that it's on an icy moon of Saturn. <laughs> so it's a very barren, rocky landscape with absolutely no foliage, uh, no air, and it's on the inside of a crater. Rocky mountains all over the place. So that's very verifiable, and so we expect the remote viewers to perceive that and come back with that. And they did it in spades. I mean, it was incredible to watch that stuff when you see them describe the verifiable elements so perfectly without a glitch. And then they noticed the thing, the set of buildings on the wall of the crater, and that's what they called it. They said there's a crater, there's a wall on the crater, and there's a set of buildings over there. And that was surprising to them. Uh, they were able to figure out that it was off-world. Uh, they put it all together, all under totally blind conditions, and then they described it. So, Rex, uh, we'll, we'll get into the details as we go along. So let me just tell people that if they want to see the actual video, the live video, which is the dive bar, I mean, it's just unbelievably interesting. The best way to do it is to just go to our website at uh, www.farsight, and that's F-A-R-S-I-G-H-T, like seeing far, dot org org because we're a nonprofit and just to click on the thing at the top saying about the iapetus thing and you can just see the videos and actually watch the entire project but uh, I'll, we'll get to the details as we go on but let me just tell you that the facility was nothing we could have ever expected or built or dreamed of or it certainly was not like a Star Wars Death Star type of thing. It was absolutely unbelievable. It was, let me put it this way. You know the guy Branson who runs Virgin Airlines? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and of course, you know also Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. Well, those people are like really rich. Well, when you're rich, but way beyond the wealth of those guys, like really rich. I mean, those guys are essentially peasants compared to the guy that built that thing on Iapetus. The When you're that rich, you, you start spending the money on things that are just out of this world. Well, I mean, like Marlon Brando, the actor, for example, he bought himself an island. I can see somebody like Branson, for example, if he had a great much more wealth than he does now, uh, or Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, maybe. But someone like Branson would likely do something like this. If he had the ability to to build uh, like a hotel, a spa, uh, a health spa, um, a resort, retreat on an, a satellite somewhere in the solar system, and if he had a, an ability to get people back and forth quickly, not using chemical rockets, of course, but using you know, modern forms of transportation that you see with the uh, the UFO phenomenon, for example. And he would probably do it. I, my guess is that the, some of the very wealthiest people would do it. Anyway, what we found out is, what the, is that there was a rich guy in our solar system 
in the ancient past, and we're talking really ancient past, we're talking a long time ago, perhaps millions of years ago, but at least 100,000 years ago. So, but, you know, we're talking not within the last couple thousand years, but we're talking maybe 100,000 years ago or more. And somebody who was wealthier than anything that you can imagine decided to build a castle on the most unimaginable place, but it was also the most beautiful spot probably in the entire solar system on Iapetus. And right above in the sky, you could see the stars perfectly, plus the rings of Saturn right above you, plus Saturn itself. It was arguably the most beautiful spot in the entire solar system. And he built this thing there, and it was a place where the very... uh, very wealthy elites went. Political elite, wealthy elite. It was the. It was not a place where the peasants groveled. It was a place where people went as a resort, and it was, you know, it was. It was not just for just normal common people. It was for the the biggest of the biggest, and they went there and they had a. It was sort of a spiritual experience, but also a health experience, and the facility is in total ruins today. But it's still there. And if we walked in it today, we would possibly find the bones of the people who died there. Because what we found out was that the facility was actively used for a while. But eventually there was a war, a war most likely in the solar system, probably the very same war that created the planet that exploded, that created the asteroid belt. And that stranded the people on Iapetus. So they couldn't go anyplace. They couldn't do anything. There was no place left for them to go after this war happened. And some of the people might have escaped on some ships, but there were some people left there. And when that happened, um, they died. That's, that's how it came to an end. So even the very wealthiest of the wealthy are not spared from human folly. <laughs> but anyway, that's it. and if we went there today, we'd probably walk around the place and look into the kitchen facilities and other rooms and we'd probably find their bones still in that in that location. You know, and also I've had the opportunity to speak with you about the remote viewing sessions uh, you have done at the Farsight Institute on Atlantis and the way that the earth was destroyed or at least the people on the earth that were destroyed thousands and thousands of years ago and you brought up the same point then which you do now even the super rich super aristocratic race or elite, you know, that they call themselves, they didn't escape the wrath either. Now, Iapetus has so many anomalies. I remember seeing Richard Hoagland's work back in the day where the pictures that he had of Iapetus, literally you could see octagon panels, and then he explained how it was put together with a tetrahedron-type truss technology the same way you would see a, a giant biodome here on planet Earth. So how were they able to make such a large structure, and before we get into that, did your findings and the findings of your remote viewers that had the opportunity to do this, did they find a wall that went around the entire satellite that was approximately 20 miles high and 20 miles wide? Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, anomaly, but, you know, they didn't, these are really good remote viewers, so when we send them to a target, they go right to that target. They don't wander about. And that wall was not right near that target. That wall is somewhere else. So if we wanted to investigate that wall, we'd have to send them on another project. So we don't really know everything that's going on on Iapetus, but it is clear that there is artificial stuff on the surface of Iapetus. And this facility is a really big thing. I mean, it is, uh, you know, you, you only with remote viewing you only know what you look at you you don't know the other stuff so you know with regard to work that's been done by other people like Richard Hoagland who I admire and, and enjoy listening to his stuff and reading his stuff a lot uh, we just simply don't know the answer to that but we do know the answer to what this set of buildings is on Iapetus that it was a facility and it was not a mining facility it was not a facility that was for scientific or military purposes. 
it was a rich guy, literally a rich guy, who built this thing out of a dream. And he got caught with his pants down eventually when the war broke out. And the facility had to be abandoned. You see, everything had to be brought in. Nothing was grown there. So there's no water. There's nothing. In fact, that thing that looks like a large set of steps might have been an artificial waterfall. This was a very unbelievably luxurious palace type thing. Way bigger than a normal human palace. I mean, it was a big, big set of buildings. And it had coverings on top of it. One of the coverings looked like, um, well, Dick Algar described it nicely. It was like the St. Louis Arch, like the big Arch of St. Louis that was uh, tipped over on its side. So it covered that and people would walk underneath it, all of which was covered in like a dome or something to, you know, keep all the air in and so on like that. But people would walk underneath this arch and they'd walk around the place and they had layer, they had hired help as well. They had a regular staff. But there was no military or scientific purpose to this facility. It was all, and the, and the buildings, you can actually see the, in the picture itself, you can actually see the, the windows on the walls of the, of the facility. They were huge panoramic windows. I mean, it was the, the, the level of beauty in that location at that spot is just unbelievable. So anyway, that's, that's, that's the, the, the essence of that. But there is one thing I'd like to emphasize, and that is that the, um, the picture itself, you can actually see the anomaly and you can see what we did, but we also help people understand it and ex- to help explain it by creating a, a different picture from an artist's perspective. And so, Rex, let me explain it this way. With low resolution or highly compressed photo photography that NASA puts out, uh, you have dark areas and light areas. And when you have high compression algorithms to make the file sizes smaller and so on, they get blurry and the dividing line between them is no longer sharp and clear, but blurry, it becomes a gray. One of the ways to fix that manually is to have an artist go in and identify the dark areas and the light areas. And then to draw a line down the middle of the dark and light areas, right through the middle of the gray area. And that's called median sharpening. What he does is he draws a line, he or she draws a line down the, the, the a separating line between the dark and the light areas. And then the light areas he covers in completely with white, and the dark areas he covers in completely with black. So it's a sharp, crisp edge between the light and the dark areas. So I think the picture from Nassau is perfectly legit, is perfectly legible. I mean, you can just look at it and say, wow, that looks like a set of buildings. But to help people out, we had an artist go in and uh, do median sharpening so that you can actually see the actual, where the windows are very clearly, where the edges of the buildings are. And then in the video uh, that we call Aliens on Iapetus, in the video, What I do is, in a portion of the video, is we alternate back and forth between the original, every second or so, between the original and the artist's version that uses median sharpening, so you can go back and forth between it, so that the eyes can get used to seeing the facility in the original photograph. And it's really very clear. And anyway, that's part of the Aliens on Iapetus video, which is available now, actually, uh, on a uh, video on demand so people can watch it like right now it's on Vimeo very high quality video and it's uh, one of our most interesting projects We've, uh, and, and uh, Rex just think about the UFO literature with everyone out there talking about aliens and UFOs what do they talk about they talk about abductions they talk about military applications they talk about secrecy within the US government all this sort of cloak and dagger deep heavy stuff when was the last time you ever heard about a facility that was built by a rich guy on a lark? <laughs> I mean, this thing is so human. It's just like what we would do. Now, the other thing is, this is important. Who did it? The people who were in that facility, they looked and acted just like us. They were humans. And so 
assuming they came from places like Mars and possibly the surface of the planet that exploded, well, they were us when we were there. But they were they not only looked like us, but also with some extraterrestrials, I, I would say almost the ma- great majority of extraterrestrials, except the ones near us uh, in this solar system, uh, but most extraterrestrials like the, the Zetas or others, uh, that, when you remote view them, they can actually see you. They actually turn in your direction and look at you and start communicating with you. It's like when you go and remote view someplace, it's like you leave an image of yourself there and they look at you. But humans cannot do that, meaning when humans are the target, humans never, ever see the remote viewer. So when we remote viewed the face on Mars and found out what that was all about, it wasn't. we didn't find any evidence that it was a, actually a face like a carved sphinx in the ground. But it was clearly a city that was like an island city surrounded by water. And there was a large population on this island. And uh, it had a wall of perimeter around it. And that those people were like us. No, Not a single one of them noticed that we were remote viewing them. They looked like us. They acted like us. I like to say they were us when we were there. Well, on Iapetus, it was the same way. So when Dick Aldeyer and Dan Smith remote viewed Iapetus, at first they saw the facility just as it is now in ruins. But then they went back in time to when it was active. And they saw the support staff. They saw the people that were there, the grandeur of the buildings, the unbelievable spectacle above them. I mean, it was beauty beyond belief. And not a single person in that facility saw Daz or Dick. So they were very, very human. They were us when we were there. That was just like us. So anyway, um, that was a very interesting thing. It's, that's what happens when people like us get essentially unlimited wealth. We do things like that, like build crazy facilities on Iapetus, and that's what they did. And actually, it's not so crazy. It's, if you have unlimited wealth, and cost is not a factor. And if you have a, a convenient way to get there quickly, like with the UFOs, their methods of transportation is much different than like chemical rockets, of course. So if you have a way to get back and getting back and forth quickly, it's a it's an ideal spot for a spa or something like that. And that's what they did with it. It's incredible. You know, I was just going to say, it sounds like the ultimate vacation getaway. That's the ultimate resort, all inclusive. <laughs> that's Next a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. But there was no military activity in that facility. There was no mining activity. There was no industrial activity. There was just people walking around, being spiritual, communing together, looking at the scars, looking at the rings of Saturn. Um, it was, <laughs> you know, you think of it as like a Zen, mood, a Zen Buddhist monk retreat uh, in in a hyperbolic form. I mean, like, it's just, uh, just, it's amazing. And so, anyway, that's, that's, that's what happened. And um, to, this, to this day, I'm, it's one of our most surprising projects. And I really hope people get a chance to watch it because it's very different than anything you'll find out there in the remote viewing literature. And I've seen your guys that you work with at the Farsight Institute. I've had a chance to see them on video doing their remote viewing sessions, and it is. It's fun to watch. It's definitely entertaining. Now, also, yeah. this makes me think of <clears throat> Phobos a bit because Phobos is most likely, or I shouldn't say most likely, but it's, there's definitely a possibility of it being an artificial-type satellite. I know that even 50, 60 years ago, military personnel with uh, the U.S. and those in the USSR would say that it was possibly an artificial satellite, and they describe it as something like a, you know, a haven for, like an ark almost, where there's yeah, things inside yeah. of it protected and such. But so Iapetus, quite the location to put something that would be a resort type setting in the rings of Saturn. Now you say that these were people just like you and I, but possibly hundreds of thousands of years ago. So the question I would ask next is. You, there's a lot of Egyptian mythology on deities that came from the stars, godlike uh, entities such as Thoth, Ra, Isis, Osiris, etc. Were yeah. your remote viewers able to find the person that actually did orchestrate and supply the funds for this 
I well, uh, that that person was perceived by Dick Algar the most, and in Dick's sessions, he describes like who did it, who this guy was, but he doesn't go into a lot of depth about the person. Um, what we found out was enough that it was a person, and that the person had incredible wealth and an ability to get there and back. Um, and he built this place, and it was in active use. But Dad Smith also went into other elements that were really, really unusual. He went into the idea that this was a, uh, the spiritual retreat orientation, the, the way that the people were going there with the understanding that they would be doing this for their own personal growth. It was not something that they were trying to spy on anything. I mean, look, the, the planet that were actively inhabited back in those days was Mars and possibly the planet that exploded. We can call that planet Maldek. That's a common name that's often used to describe the planet. So for lack of a better word, we can use it. And if Maldek and Mars were the ones were the planets that were inhabited back in those days, well, you know, Iapetus was not anywhere close to those places. So it was really a getaway, a retreat that was very distant from the home planet that they came from, whether it was Mars or Maldek. And so there's, there's two things that are really relevant. When we, when we go on a vacation, we often go to a faraway island or someplace exotic. And if you have unlimited wealth, that's someplace that you might think about, you know, like Unlimited wealth and ability to go the farther, the more exotic, the more away, you know, the better it gets. So um, that's really what they really, that, that was really the, the focus was of this guy to have people have the, the ultimate experience. And that's what they did when they went there. I mean, just imagine it, Rex. You're sitting on an icy moon that's one of the most barren and stark environments that you could ever imagine with mountain ranges all over the place in a plush hotel that beats anything on the planet Earth. And right above you is the rings of Saturn. And with no atmosphere, you've got an uninhibited view of the stars as well. And you have Saturn. I mean, give me a break. Can you imagine a more beautiful spot on the entire solar system? I can't imagine any spot on the solar system that would be as gorgeous as that spot. And that's what the person did. But Dan Smith also suggested that there might have been a special, almost spiritual reason for that exact location. There was some energy or, first of all, there was a meteor that crashed there. He went back and traced the meteor that hit the, he, they clearly saw it as a meteor crater. But there was also like an energy that was beaming into the facility from, the, from outside. So it might have been that the facility was not generating its own power. Um, but maybe it was also receiving power to say microwave transmission from some other off-planet source. At any rate, there was a, a lot of energy going into that facility. It wasn't just just a, a building on a rock. Uh, there was a and and so and Dick Elgier also noted that some of the energy facilities or, or or elements within the structure are still active today. So there's still an energy residual in the structure. So if you went there today, you would find the possibly most likely you'd find the dead bodies maybe the dust of the dead bodies of the people who were abandoned there when they had to leave the planet. No, leave when, when the, actually, as I mentioned earlier, there was apparently a war, and that war made it impossible for the people to leave. There was no place to go to. And they, uh, that was probably the war that it's, created the, uh, the asteroid belt, that planet that exploded. So we'd see their bones were and their dust. Out, were you able to find out where the attack came from? No, it was not an attack on the facility. The facility itself was not attacked. It was just abandoned. Actually, it wasn't even abandoned. The, the supply ships stopped coming. So it wasn't that it was abandoned in the sense that everybody got on ships and left and went home. There was apparently no home to go to anymore. And so the people that were there were stranded. And I'm assuming that if we went there today, we would see, we would walk around and see the bones. But Dick Algar also perceived that there's some some energy stuff still there. So 
not everything was turned off. They might have some reactors that are working at very low power. And sort of, oh, Dick, uh, Dad Smith also reported this. They both reported it. It's like it's on standby mode or something. But So if we went there, we could probably walk in and flip some switches and turn the lights back on. But it's uh, something like that. And, you know, this is not something that is, there, is total. Go ahead. Is there a possibility that there could still be people there? No. There's nobody alive there. There can be bones there. There can be dust from their bones. There can be mummified bodies, but there's no live person in the facility right now. There's nothing that could sustain those people. There's, there's no food to eat. Whoever was there was stranded, and they ate. This is actually reported by the remote viewers. They ate all the food that was there. They drank all the water till there was nothing left. They had not, no place to go to. Now, what was not covered is some of the people might have actually got off the place on ships, but it's unclear where they would have gone. And so, but let's say some people did. Then other people, there might not have been enough ships to get everybody off the plant, off the saddle, off the off the uh, off of Iapetus. So, if there was not enough for everybody to get off, then the, those people would have been stranded, and no one would have come back for them. Because even if they did have a ship, where would they go with the ship? I mean, they. I'm assuming the ships that they were using were inter were interplanetary, but not interstellar. If they had an interstellar ship, they might have been able to go someplace. But where would they go? I mean, they have to know some place to go. But I'm assuming that the ships that they have were uh, interplanetary, and they could have gotten back to Mars. Now, you have to understand the the results that we had for the Cydonia region and for the Planet That Exploded project clearly indicate what happened. Mars was very close to whatever that planet was that exploded. Let's call it Maltec. And we know that because one half of the surface of Mars is heavily cratered, really heavily cratered. And the other half is crater-free. So also the, the cratered side of Mars is thicker on the crust than the non-cratered side. It's like a kilometer thicker. So whatever exploded not, sort of hit Mars like a shotgun blast on one side and put a ton of debris down. And so when that happened, we know that life really sort of, that was a bad day for Mars, but it, didn't, it did not end Mars as a viable planet completely. Life finds a way. We know that the people that were on Mars built themselves back. It may have taken 100,000 years. It may have taken a while, but they did it. And we know that because there is undeniable evidence now that there was a that after that happened, there was a nuclear fission explosion on the surface of Mars. And that has been documented in two books. The most recent just came out this March this year by John Brandenburg called Death on Mars. And the radioactive isotope evidence for people who do nuclear forensics is absolutely not in dispute. It's absolutely clear. There was a, a fission nuclear reaction, a bomb, on the surface of Mars. And that is what blew the rest of the atmosphere away. That's what ended Mars as a, that was the final straw that broke the camel's back that ended Mars as a place where people could live. Because then Let the me atmosphere jump in was... real quick, Courtney. Um, if I may, in 1995, yeah. there was a Time magazine uh, that came out in addition to Time magazine, and the very front cover was a picture of Mars, and that cover shows Mars with a blue atmosphere. Clearly, you can see that there's a north and south pole. It doesn't look like a, a red planet. And since then, I haven't seen any pictures that portray it with, you know, Earth-like atmosphere. So my question is, when did that take place? The explosion um, that you're referring to. When did the explosion? There are various theories about when that happened, but it looks like it was, uh, one of the theories seems to be that it, it may have been around um, 100,000 years ago. So we're not talking hundreds of millions of years ago. We're talking about something in the relatively recent past, but it's, uh, you know, the person who's done the most work on that on, on when the planet exploded is Thomas Van Flandern. 
And he wrote a book that sort of details all of that information. And one of the ways that they use to describe when that exoplanet happened is to look at the periods of comets. Because some comets come in with a certain period and that they're coming back into the stars, into the, they're coming back in to the center of the solar system for the very first time. So you look at how long it took for them to come back based on where they started. And by looking at their period, and if this is the first time they're coming back in, you have a basic idea of when they were knocked out. So you have an idea of when the explosion happened. Anyway, Thomas Van Flandern wrote that book, and that was the sort of best way to sort of answer that question. We just to go back to the original source of Thomas Van Flandern's work about when that happened. But it doesn't seem to have been in the, in the uh, hundreds of millions of years. It seems to have been in the more recent past. The, uh, the nuclear explosion seems to have been about 100,000 years ago. The explosion of the planet seems to have occurred definitely before that, but not too far before that. So we're talking about the relatively recent past. Now, you know, um, Earth was not a place where people would actually want to come. You can sort of think of, well, this is a nice place. Why didn't they just come here? Well, this is actually where everybody did come. Either they came here on ships after escaping whatever catastrophes they were having over there or they died and once they died they had to go somewhere so they started over again by being born onto this planet as babies and that's the normal way of getting here just being born here so if you if you die on one planet um, you don't have you can either it is only one way you can, you, you know, death is actually a, a means of transportation in a sense. You die on one planet and you can be born on another and you have to choose where you go. So Earth was a likely destination. However, of the three planets that used to be here, Earth was not the optimal place. Um, let's, look a look, let's take a look at Earth and why this is. We may think of this as our dear Earth, but the reality is this is a lousy place for a long-term civilization. It's really a very bad planet for a long-term civilization. First, it's a heavy planet. The gravity is, is heavy. The atmosphere is very thick. The storms are very severe. They have these huge hurricanes and tornadoes and things like that. And, and this is the most important thing. It's 8,000 miles in diameter, and it's entirely made of liquid molten rock. The whole 8,000 miles is a giant lake of lava. And it's covered like a balloon by an 8-mile thin crust. And so this 8-mile thin crust that we live on is sitting on top of an 8,000-mile diameter liquid ball of molten rock. Now, for a few thousand years, that's perfectly okay. The crust is relatively stable. And we're fine for 2, 3, 4, 5, 6,000 years. But eventually, the sun will burp in our direction with a coronal uh, ejection. And what will happen is that the liquid rock that is heavily made up of iron and other, other metals, it will, it will wiggle, it will jiggle. And when that does, the crust will crinkle. And the whole planet will go through a tumultuous time period now, there is a professor at Boston University called, named Robert Schock, S-C-H-O-C-H. He's a tenured professor at Boston University. He's done a tremendous amount of research on past civilizations that clearly predate the earliest civilizations that the mainstream science suggests happened. Mainstream science suggests that we were all basically hunter-gatherers up until 5,000 years ago. And then there were people that built the pyramids, and that was the beginning of civilization, and that was it. But Robert Schock has collected a great deal of information in his book, Forgotten Civilizations, about other places that archaeologists are just beginning to look at, such as Gobekli Tepe, which is a huge archaeological dig site in Turkey, and it has a, basically a city, a large city, that is buried under the ground. Now, the interesting thing about it, it wasn't buried by the years of time. It was purposely buried by the inhabitants. 
meaning they covered their own city with a roof as if they were trying to protect themselves. So they buried themselves. That's a lot of work to bury themselves. And it was an indication that something was happening to the sun and they needed to live underground. But that goes back 10,000 years, which predates by double what mainstream science says. And and basically, according to mainstream science, we should be hunter-gatherers. But here's this, this city buried underground that is as complex, at least, and its construction is the Great Pyramid of Giza. And mainstream science has nothing to say about it, but it's as clear as day. I mean, you can just jump on a jet and go out there and look at it. I mean, it's such a, a huge thing. And so there are other things. There's another book uh, called For, uh, For, Forbidden Archaeology by a, a different a different person, not Robert Schock. And, uh, Michael Creason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, he's... Com- he's compiled a huge amount of information in, in ex- with an extraordinary amount of detail, all tremendously documented with citations all over the place. It's a really fat book of uh, archaeological evidence suggesting that there were advanced civilizations on Earth going back perhaps millions of years. And none of that is allowed to be taught in universities. Uh, universities are very strict with respect to what they allow to be taught. So, I mean, I'm a professor at a major university, but I teach statistics and nonlinear differential equations. I'm a mathematician that works in a social science program. So, you know, I know the university system well. There's very strict controls over what can be tolerated at the university. And information has to be accepted at the mainstream before it can really be allowed into the university. So, mainstream is the last the last element to accept radically new ideas. So, you know, when Michael Creighton uh, wrote this book, um, Forbidden Archaeology, he did so as a work of service to all of humanity who had to basically have a record that all of this stuff exists. Anyway, so, yeah, so this place is not a place where a long-term civilization would normally form. We have had civilizations in the past, a great many of them, and they've crashed, died, and burned. And a lot of, some of it is due because of human folly, but others is due to just natural phenomena such as the sun. This is, this is not a good planet for a long-term civilization to be on. So it was natural for people on Mars or Maldek to want to, uh, you know, stay there and to come to Earth sort of as a last resort. This is a beautiful planet for a biological or zoological garden. It's really perfect for that, for biological and zoological garden, for plants and animals. But for a long-term civilization, you need about a million years of absolutely uninterrupted peace and quiet to let the civilization mature. And you don't get that on this planet. So, Which again, you're good, for, I would you're good for a few... Go ahead. Okay, I would just like to ask you, as far as the people that lived in Iapetus and our ancestors of hundreds of thousands of years ago, were their lifespans within the thousands of years, 10,000 years, 20,000 years, or did they have a a typical 80-year lifespan? You know, um, that's a really good question. Uh, Michael Cremo, who wrote Forbidden Archaeology, goes into that to some extent where he talks about some evidence that people might have lived at different, different levels. But it it seems to be that extraterrestrials have been involved with human affairs since the very beginning. And it seems to be that the human genome, the DNA of humanity has been set up to die off rather quickly. So we have lifespans that typically run like 70 years. But there's no real reason that the genes couldn't be fiddled with so that someone would live a longer lifespan. Now, there's there's evidence that this can be possible. For example, there's ways to fiddle with the person's body now such that someone can live longer. One of the ways that has been discovered is by... Uh, burning the body in an extremely lean mixture, like like a car and it's running on gasoline. You burn it on a lean mixture, uh, very few calories, and what you'll get 
is very few deposits and other things, and you just won't wear it out so quickly. And that requires, it's very hard to do, and very few people can do it. But basically, it's called caloric restriction. But according to research dealing with worms, and bugs, and lower-level animals, it seems to be able to double the age limit. So people, if people did things on an equivalent level, we'd be living to, say, 120-year lifespan. So, I mean, it's easy to do it with bugs and, and worms and things like that because they, they live a relatively short lifespan, so you can watch them. And if they're supposed to live three months and then they live six months, it's easy to find out what this caloric restriction will do. But uh, the very fact that it's theoretically possible seems to suggest that there would be genes that would be able to be manipulated to let people live a, a, a much longer lifespan. So it seems to be that whoever designed the human genome was interested in a species that would have a rapid turnover, that you would be born, you'd live a life, wouldn't hang around for too long, and then go. Now, there's two possible reasons that I can speculate on this. One is sort of a good reason and one sort of a malevolent reason. If it was, let's go over to the malevolent one first. If you were trying to manipulate the species so that it would basically stay sort of imprisoned so that it would never really discover who it is, its place in the galaxy, uh, it would say sort of a repressed species, then you'd want the people to live a short lifespan because you, they would need to live longer to be able to put two and two together and figure out everything. Okay, now there's another way, a positive way to interpret that. If you wanted a short lifespan to happen, it might be because of personality growth reasons. If, so, if you have someone living to 200 years old, well, they're not going to be cycling through the bodies and having a great many experiences. They're going to be basically having one experience over a longer period of time. And it might be beneficial for people to have a rich experience, a poor experience, an experience where they were a victim of violence, an experience where they were perpetrators of violence, an experience where they fell in love, an experience where they had no love. You know, a great variety of experiences. And having a short lifespan allows you to cycle through all those experiences relatively quickly and gain a tremendous amount out of the human experience. So that's a sort of a positive spin on it. So whatever the reasons were, there might be a mixture of positive and malevolent over time, but the reality is now we have relatively short lifespans. It, it is interesting to note that within the, uh, the UFO abduction literature, a great many people say in communicating when they're on ships with the extraterrestrials on the ships, many people come back and note that they're told that the other extraterrestrials tend to live longer. Uh, the average lifespan seems to be in the galaxy from these reports of about 150 years, whereas some people live longer than that, like two, three hundred years, 400 years. And uh, we seem to be on the short side of things, which is not necessarily bad, because if we wanted when we die, you can be born into a species that lives longer. So it's, you know, you don't, no one ever really dies. So having a short lifespan doesn't really, it just means your experience is a little different than you will have uh, when you have a experience with a longer living species. And um, it, it, what it actually is, is it sets, a, it sets up some challenges that we have. And our challenges are to put as much as we can in a short period of time as part of the human experience. And that's sort of interesting. In, in a reality, in a, in a real way, it's like a, a limitation that we have, but it's not necessarily a bad limitation. It's a, an interesting limitation. <laughs> right, right. And some people that, let's say, have a certain religious belief, uh, some Christians mm -hmm. believe yeah. that only human beings have souls, for example. And I've pondered this theory many times myself. Maybe your consciousness is the level of soul that you have. So even as a spider, the amount of consciousness that it has, taking that to the next level is just going to be energy, consciousness equals spirit. Now, the Old Testament talks about people that live to be eight, 900 years old. Yeah. And do you, do you feel that these 
people that were running around, traveling the stars, going to beautiful resorts on Iapetus, do you think that they had lifespans at that point, maybe living eight, 900 years old or maybe closer to 150, 200 years old? I can only, this is, this is speculation now because we didn't, that wasn't reported in the remote viewing data, but I can only assume that the lifespans of species that were not on Earth were longer by a lot. So, uh, you know, we are what we are. And again, don't think of it as a bad thing. It, it's just a thing, uh, meaning it's, it's, just, it's just sort of what happened. And you're not limited in terms of the experiences that you can have in life by the uh, short lifespan you have now, because a lot of beings could be born into a fetus that was going to be aborted. And the only thing they really wanted to experience is that beginning of life as a fetus, and that's all they wanted. Um, you know, there's no... The biggest trouble in dealing with all of this with humans is that humans tend to think, because the illusion of singularity, of isolation, is so severe with humans, humans tend to think of life as one of a kind, meaning this is all you've got, and if you're not having all of it, everything you need, everything you want, you're being cheated. That's not correct even a little bit. No one ever really dies, and eternity is a long time. So this is just an experience you have. It's like, think of it as a walk down the street to go to the drugstore or the grocery store. Well, you know, it's not the only walk you're ever going to have. There's, there's a lot of walks. There's a lot of drugstores. There's a lot of times you're going to go out. So, um, so what would you say to the atheist or to the skeptic about you know, giving them some type of validation that there really is life after this physical existence. Well, if there's anything that the remote viewing phenomenon indicates without any ambiguity whatsoever is that we are more than our physical bodies, meaning when we remote view, we're perceiving outside of our physical bodies. We're not using our eyes. We're not using our hearing, touch, taste, or smell. We're using non-local perception. So clearly our existence is not bound by the laws of traditionally understood physics of quantum mechanics and relativistic physics because we're able to transfer information perceptually across time and space in complete violation of the accepted laws of physics. And that shouldn't surprise everyone because the basic fundamentals of quantum mechanics and relativistic physics, as it's taught in mainstream science, have not changed for over a hundred years. The details have changed. The we now do quantum computing and stuff like that. But the fundamentals, the interpretations and so on, that hasn't changed for over 100 years. So you know that's all screwed up because nothing in science lasts 100 years unchanged. So, you know, it's um, the, the whole scientific endeavor of what this means for us is not well understood by mainstream anybody. And the atheists tend to align themselves with mainstream scientific thinking and saying there's no evidence of a God and things like that. But actually, atheists are not skeptics. They like to consider themselves skeptics. Like, I think um, one of the most skeptical groups out there that is often quite anti-religion, it seems, from my perspective and perhaps some other people's perspective, is a group that's known as PSYCOPs, so the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of the Claims of the Paranormal. And I don't, they like to consider themselves skeptics, and they publish a magazine called Skeptics. But I don't consider them skeptics at all. I consider them uh, firm believers. They just believe opposite from the religious people. And so if I'm talking to people that are calling themselves skeptics and they're members of that group, I don't look at them as skeptics. I look at them as people on the opposite side of the religious people. And so both sides, the religious people and those so-called skeptical people, which are not skeptics, um, they're polarized thought. One is totally opposite from the other. And I consider myself a, a skeptic because a skeptic, as it should be understood, the true meaning of the word, is an open mind on everything and says this is all a possibility. 
But the people who call themselves skeptics, like Committee for the Scientific Investigation, the claims of the paranormal psychops, they're not skeptics, even though they like to call themselves skeptics, because they're, they're firm believers. And so uh, I would say to the atheists that the remote viewing phenomenon is absolutely unambiguous in demonstrating that, we're, that we are not limited to the physical body. So that when the physical body goes away, we are left. Whatever it, was, whatever it is that we're using when we're remote viewing, we're clearly transferring information across time and space instantly. So our consciousness exists independent of the physical body. And our consciousness, our personalities, and, and also the remote viewing evidence seems to suggest that we actually have a physical type of form that's not associated with our physical body. For example, there have been numerous cases where a remote viewer would see another remote viewer at a site under totally blind conditions, meaning they weren't told that the other remote viewer was ever told to go to that target. And so a remote viewer would see another remote viewer there. And extraterrestrials often tend to see remote viewers when they're there. So obviously, whatever it is with our consciousness seems to have some type of physical shape associated with it when we do the remote viewing. So when you die and the body's not there, well, it's like when you're remote viewing. Obviously, the, the body wasn't necessary to do the remote viewing, so obviously when the body goes away, um, we're still there. Then the real question is, what do you, where do you go? Where do you go after that? Now, the, the people who are atheists and the people who believe that there's no such thing as remote viewing and that when the physical body dies, at the end, and so on. Well, those people have been seduced by the persuasiveness of the physical experience. Meaning our physical experience and our bodies that we have is very, very persuasive. And the reason it's persuasive, it was designed to be that way. For example, if you were a member of the Zeta Reticuli, the Zetas, the little short gray guys with the wraparound eyes, they, they live a in a hive mind, they don't really understand isolation. They all are together, like the Borg, in a way. And they don't understand what it means to be alone. So if you look at the human experience, we're on the opposite end of that, where we like to actually think of ourselves as alone. We like a a solitary walk in the garden. We like to go backpacking out into the woods all by ourselves. We like that sense of isolation. When we're in the bathroom, we like knowing that the door is closed and we're by ourselves. That's a very alien experience for a great many extraterrestrials. And so what you can think of the human experience is it's like bungee jumping. For example, if you're a bungee jumper, I don't know if you've ever done this, Rex, but what they do is they they go to like a bridge and they tie a rope around their ankle. And they tie the other end to the bridge and then they jump off the bridge and they bounce around, boing, 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 boing. And the only thing that stops you from dying is this rope that's tied around your ankle as you bounce around on the end of it. Well, that's like what it's like to be a human. The connection between us and everything else is so very thin. It seems as if we're just all by ourselves. Now, how do you do that? You do that by having the brain to be genetically designed. It's a, the brain is essentially a very sophisticated hologram generator, meaning of all physicists that exist in the whole world, not a single one has ever found anything solid, ever. Meaning you can say, I have my desk, I have my body, my house, but those are not solid things. It's all empty space with molecules inside. Inside the molecules, empty space with atoms. Inside the atoms, empty space with protons, neutrons, electrons. Inside those things, and down the rabbit hole it goes. They've never, no one has ever found a solid, indivisible, billiard ball type of thing. There's no right. solid anything. Now, there are some physicists who are still looking for those things, and those are called particleists. But those people are dying off. There's almost none left. The only thing that's ever been found are, is energy, waves. So that means that the whole universe is a frequency-based universe with just energy in it. And energy equals mass times the speed of light squared equals mc squared. So energy and mass are comparable. So, but basically that means is that our brains are hologram generators that select out certain frequencies that it wants us to see. And it screens out all other frequencies 
that it doesn't want us to see. So that we only see the here and now. It screens out other people's thoughts. It screens out the past. It screens out the future. And so you see only the lion that's in front of you today. You don't see the gazelle that was in front of you yesterday. And you don't see the elephant that was in front of you tomorrow. So anyway, uh, it basically is a hologram generator. And so what we are is a, is a, um, a very, very convincing reality. We, are in a, we have a very convincing reality. And that reality makes us think that there is only one of us. And this is it. And the skeptics or the atheists, they have been seduced by the quality of that illusion. It's a very, very good quality. Sorry for the long answer, but it was an interesting question. It is, and I appreciate the answer. On top of that, when you look at these different frequencies that, you know, you bring up, for example, that you can't find the finite point. There hasn't been a single physicist that can find actual solid uh, matter. So could it all be everything, all the neutrons and electrons and protons? Do you think it could all be the same piece of matter, you know, just bouncing around all over the place? Is this... No, there's no matter. There's no matter. There's no mass in the entire universe. There's only energy. And so physicists have not yet been able to wrap their heads around it because they still talk in terms of mass, yet they've never been able to find matter. I mean, real, solid, anything. So they talk right. about they talk about things as having mass. They talk about things as being solid. And then they forget all that and they start talking about never being able to find anything solid. <laughs> so they they right, haven't right. really so, figured out how to they haven't really figured out how to talk about it. But you know, as a scientist myself, I'm just connecting the dots and I'm saying, well the reality is and the only way this can work is if we are living in a hologram and that the brain is generating that hologram. And it generates it the same way out of a frequent out of a set of frequencies that our radios generate a signal that we can listen to a station by screening out all other stations, all other frequencies. And our television, when we watch something on the TV, we're looking at something that the television is getting from frequencies and assembling a picture. And that picture is there because the television screened out all other channels. So our brains are essentially very sophisticated televisions uh, in the sense that it's a 3D image that it's creating, so it's a hologram generator. But all of these frequencies have to interact, and that's, in fact, how the remote viewing works. The remote viewing works by simply training the brain to allow in some frequencies that it normally would screen out. That's what the training of remote viewing is all about, getting people used to allowing certain perceptions to sort of hang in there and to focus on them without getting this screening to happen. And when you see Dick Algeyer and Daz Smith actually do their work, and I really recommend you to watch the, the most recent project, the Iapetus one, because you actually see them live, recorded on video, them doing their work. It's, right, it's very clear that they're seeing it with a level of clarity that's at least as good as what they'd get with their physical eyes if they were there. And in terms of the descriptions they're making, they're making really very clear descriptions. And I say at least as good because they also have the ability to move through time and to move around in space. So they actually have some advantages that they wouldn't have if they were there with their physical eyes. But the quality of the remote viewing that you see is really such... You have to see it to believe it. Um, you know, it's very much like playing the piano. If you told somebody that you could make the piano produce music, it's miraculous, and they had never heard a pianist, a major pianist play, they'd say, like, oh, how you, how do you, what are you trying to... Get me? Well, anybody can go up to the piano and play chopsticks, but if you want to play in Carnegie Hall like Lang Lang, then you have to practice for a long, long time. But that's what these remote viewers are like. So for someone who is skeptical about the remote viewing phenomenon, they just haven't seen someone like Dick Algeyer or Dad Smith do sessions. It's like they've never gone to Carnegie Hall and seen someone like Lang Lang perform the piano. If you've never heard that it, if you've never heard someone play like that, you would never know that it really could be done. And so for those people who would like to see it happen, they can see it happen now live on video. By the way, I should say that we just 
uh, recently, like today, got Amazon on board. So uh, it's available also as a DVD on Amazon for those people who like the DVD format. Amazon's a, you know, they've got a lot of good stuff on there. Now, it's interesting, you bring up uh, some good points. You're not going to be able to compete in the Tour de France and keep up with the Peloton if you don't have experience and a ton of practice. You're going to have to get yourself up to that level. Even if you're born uh, an athlete, you're still going to have to practice to get there. So people that mm -hmm. might be skeptical might want to remember that most people can only see 0.01% of the electromagnetic light spectrum and then your brain filters out about 50% of that, like you say. So you bring up some really good points. And when I've seen these guys on, you know, on these videos, like I watched the Iaptus video, the Atlantis video, you could clearly see that they're seeing something that you're not, and they've just got enough experience and practice to actually do that. So one thing that I'd like to get into, we've only got about 20 minutes left, and this Iaptus phenomenon is absolutely incredible. You talked earlier about how it's, it was used as like a spiritual temple. And if their DNA was different back then, obviously your DNA can control what you see, what you do, your physical aspects, etc. So were they able to do what today some people, what the layman might call magic? I mean, could they teleport? Could they levitate type things? Could they walk through walls? Could they create fire out of their mind? And were your remote viewers able to find any of this information? No. They were the people on Iapetus were just like us. They were just like you and I. And the same thing for the people that lived in the Cydonia region of Mars when we did the project on Cydonia, which is also available now that people can see. It's really a great one. The Cydonia project also has uh, a very detailed descriptions of the subway systems. We have very good pictures of some of the subway tunnels that have uh, been exposed through erosion. So the uh, the we have a good descriptions of what's inside those tunnels. Um, you know, the civilization... You, you know, i got to jump in here real quick because you sure. brought up the tunnel systems in Mars and the subway systems. If you have seen the first Total Recall, um, there's that giant pyramid in the first Total yeah. Recall on Mars that, you know, is supposed yeah, to like create... That. Yeah, so didn't it's you guys it's like that. use stuff that was very similar to that? Yeah, the tunneling system that they have on Mars is similar to... A, some of the stuff you see in those movies. You know, a lot you of the movies... Well, there's a couple things. We all came from someplace. We all lived life somewhere else. So we're all going to have some memory, even if we don't recognize it as memory. I think of it as just something we thought of. But we're all going to have some memory of the past in some way. So it's natural that we would create movies that reflect some of the history that we have experienced. So it's very possible that some of these movies come from writers who are piecing together creative ideas that don't really understand that they're bringing these things up through their subconscious uh, that are memory oriented. There's been some talk on the internet, for example, about George Lucas is his whole star Wars set of movies. Uh, one theory is that, that there was actually a, a galactic war of that type in our in our galaxy, and that George Lucas may have been one of the freedom fighters, that there might have actually been some people like the Jedi, uh, and that he's remembering some of that. And he, he doesn't remember it as, he doesn't think of it as his memories, but these ideas have to come from someplace. So, you know, it's, it's very possible that a lot of the stuff we see on the mainstream media, such as Star Trek, uh, Star Wars, uh, Total Recall, things like that, that they may actually come from memories that we have had. They're not just sort of created out of whole cloth. It's a very, you know, there's so many questions that don't have direct answers, but we at Farsight, I must admit, there, I've not seen any other group anywhere, regardless of funding, resolve and come up with more answers than we have come up with with our projects. And we've got new projects coming up. Um, for an underfunded group like us, I, I've never seen such a small underfunded group come up with so much novel, interesting, good information, new information. By the way, there's one thing before we end that I'd really like to emphasize to people. When you come to our website to see these projects, 
www.farsight.org, F-A-R-S-I-G-H-T.org. One thing it's really important to do is remember that we're a nonprofit, so we don't have any money for advertisement. The only way we really have to tell people what we're doing is our newsletter, which is free. It comes out once a week. And people should click on the subscribe to our newsletter button, just put in their email addresses. We don't give out the email addresses for any reason to anyone ever. And so there's no spam, just our newsletter once a week. And it's really a, you know, a, the only way we have to sort of let people know what we're doing. And I can tell you over the next three weeks, we have a ton of stuff we're going to be announcing. So it's uh, when you come to our website, do housekeeping first. Sign up for the newsletter and then go on and take a look at the Iapetus and the Sidonia Mars Project. And if you're interested in some of the other projects, like the 9-11 events, and also how the Great Pyramid of Giza was constructed. Uh, those are all there. Also, the, Atlanta pro- the Atlantis Project, which was a ancient human civilization that was about 100 years more technologically advanced than we are today, that destroyed itself. That project is available now for free on YouTube, and you can get to that through our website as well. So most of the stuff on our website is for free. There's a few things that we have for video projects that we, we sell. But most of the stuff is for free, including a huge amount of instructional material, over 20 hours of, of uh, remote viewing instruction, all for free, hosted by YouTube, the free printable text and the methods and the whole thing. But sign up for the newsletter first. That's that's the one thing I really wanted to get all of the audience to, to do because we're going to be announcing some major stuff with YouTube over the next three weeks. So uh, that's something important to keep up with. That's, that's the way you'll be able to hear about it. You know, some people might say, with these type of abilities, you'd think you'd be able to read the next lottery ticket. So, Every problem has its own solution. And the lottery is a separate problem. With regard to remote viewing, we have had many projects where we have worked on remote viewing the future. And what we have, the, re- the data that we have uh, where we've explicitly tested for this unambiguously indicate that we live in a frequency-based universe that has an infinite number of timelines. That means from any moment of the now, there's a branching, and there is no single future. So there is no single future where a single lottery ticket exists, meaning every moment of the now has multiple futures where there are multiple different combinations of the lottery. So when you're remote viewing the future, which one? That's the problem with remote viewing the lottery. You can accurately remote view the lottery, but you don't know which timeline you're going to remote view it. And so the chances of it being the timeline that you're on when you actually buy your ticket is very small. So every problem has its own solution. We have not figured out a way to solve that particular problem. But that doesn't mean that the rest of the remote going is not real. Every problem has its own solution, but what we have figured out already is already done. Uh, We can clearly remote view the past and know exactly where we are, and we know why. We know the physics of it. And we can clearly remote view the present. Remote viewing the future is a little different because it's a little harder to control the timeline that you're on when you remote view the future. It can be controlled. We have found one method that we can deterministically control which future timeline you're on. But that method has not been able to be adapted to the uh, purchasing of lottery tickets. So we're, we're still thinking about all of this. It's a, it's a, live, it's a very much lively science uh, that's tremendously engaging and interesting. So, yeah. You know, it's interesting because I saw a TV show on the History Channel once that asked a remote viewer the same question, and his answer, in my opinion, wasn't as honest. Uh, he said something along the lines of, well, I wouldn't want to use my abilities for such petty uh, you know, for such petty things. And, for example, if you were able to get a million dollars out of a lottery ticket to fund your future endeavors, you know, I mean, that might be an idea. But, you know, I appreciate that. That's definitely, that definitely makes a lot more sense. If we're no, in a reality there's absolutely, test, Yeah, there's absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I've heard that type of thing before. That's really stupid. There's nothing wrong with uh, <laughs> buying a lottery ticket and earning millions of dollars from it. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is it's very difficult to do. Um, in fact, I'm a... From an educational perspective, it would be very valuable because you could say that you won right. these millions of dollars through using the remote viewing, and that becomes an educational tool for telling people about the reality of remote viewing. But it's just not easy to do. 
I'm not saying it won't be able to be done in the future. I'm just saying we haven't wrapped our head around a way to resolve the multiple reality element, uh, the multiple timeline element with respect to that particular problem. And I was just going to say, I know that your work has a lot of controversy. A lot of people out there might have you know, skeptical thoughts towards it, but if you take something that somebody remote views and you have physical evidence of what they remote view, if they do it blindly and they come up with a sketch that looks exactly like the picture that you wanted them to find, in my opinion, yeah. that, that's pretty good evidence. But what? Yeah, and we do it, and we do it now live on video, so you don't have to trust like a piece of paper and sort of look at the paper. Now you see them describe it, and they're using words, verbal, physical words. They're they're talking, right. and so you hear the full description in a normal way. That's changed everything. It's very convincing when you see people do the remote viewing live on video like we do now. Right, and I had the opportunity to watch them. I've studied books on FBI, um, you know, the FBI handbook on how to watch people's body language to tell if they're lying or something like that, and they, they seemed pretty darn convincing to me when I watched them. They were just flowing with what they were, you know, what they were thinking, and that was quite incredible. But what's in the future for Farsight, Courtney? Well, that's actually a really interesting question. We're actively working with YouTube right now uh, on uh, on sort of creating a, a new level of audience engagement. And there will be another a YouTube channel. Our current YouTube channel has been completely revamped. We're going to be announcing all of this pretty soon on our on our newsletter. But we have new creative works coming up that are being worked on. Our, our real focus right now is expanding our audience to especially the younger generation because they are literally going to be inheriting the earth just because they're younger. And we really want to be able to engage them to make them understand that we're something that we're interesting to to look at. And so we're doing everything from creating music videos that contain remote viewing information and uh, movie ideas, well, web series. Um, uh, again, the YouTube channel is much different than it sort of than it, than it used to be, but we'll be announcing that on our on our newsletter. The YouTube channel is also we're actually creating having a new YouTube channel as well that will have more entertainment related stuff because a lot of young people don't want to be lectured to. They get that a lot in school. They want you right. to say things that are fun, so they want it in a different format. And so we're trying to package things in different formats that. It's like being multilingual. Uh, it's very wrong to think of it as dumbing down. That's not correct. It's correct to think of it as multilingual. The young people have very quick minds. They can get a lot of information in a short period of time. Three minutes, five minutes, seven minutes is a long time for them. They just snap, 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 put it all together. They don't need to sit there for three hours listening to a lecture. Um, the style of information reception has changed for the younger generation. The older generations are taught from the very beginning to listen to long lectures, long presentations. That's something that they learned in school. But the young people now, use, with the Internet the way it is, they, they flip from one spot to the next. And they can, some people call it like a, a, a short attention span, but it's not that. They capture as much as they need. And then when they've got as much as they need from one spot, they zip to another spot. It's a, a different type of information processing. Anyway, so that's what we're doing. And you'll see all of that coming out over the next three weeks. So that's a good reason to be signed up to our newsletter. Great. I get your newsletter every week. And, yeah, you've always got good information on there. A lot of stuff you talk about definitely isn't discussed in the mainstream media. So, I'm really looking forward to your future works, and we definitely got to have you on here again sometime, Courtney. I really appreciate you coming out. Rex, I appreciate being here and being invited back. The next project we're going to have is about the Phoenix Lights, and that, among some people who have already seen some of the data, um, it seems to be one of their favorites. So you're going to be really surprised when we discuss what really happened during the Phoenix Lights. But in the meantime, yeah, that I Iapetus and uh, the Iapetus and the Cydonia projects are real showstoppers to actually see the remote viewers describe those two extraterrestrial locations and who was there. It's amazing. It's, a, it's beyond amazing. Well, and real quick, was that pyramid that you guys remote viewed, was that in Sidonia? 
Uh, the pyramid, uh, that, that's a different project. That's called the Great or Pyramid the of Giza. Yeah, right. The that was the, that that, produce air. Yeah, the Great Pyramid of Giza. That was how that was actually built. And it turned out, to my great surprise, that that was actually built with extraterrestrial technology. And that's another project that we have that's also available on our website, www.farsite.org. And, um, but the, the Mars thing uh, in Cydonia, that was the face on Mars, the so-called face on Mars. Again, we found no evidence that it was actually a face. It might be, but we didn't, the remote viewers didn't describe it that way. But it was definitely artificial. It was uh, like a city, three kilometers from corner to corner. It had poor people living on it, shantytown. It had very rich people living on it, middle class. had a subway system underneath it. They had religious people like fanatics, <laughs> charismatic leaders. Uh, it was just like Earth, except it was there. Yeah, and also I remember that structure that you talked about that uh, you guys remote viewed on Mars that possibly still had inhabitants in it. Um, that's what I was referring oh. to as the pyramid-type structure. Yeah, that was the domes. There were some domes, and that was a different. That was a that was a scientific slash military facility that still got people in it. And uh, we actually it's a it's an actual base on Mars, and we saw it in a picture that was supplied by NASA, and we remote viewed it with uh, two groups, CRV group and HRVG group, and came back with a complete description of what's going on there. Now, the people that are actually in that facility are not the people who built it. They are they, The people who built it left it, abandoned it, and the people who are there now are using it. Uh, they have a spare parts problem. Not all that works. They're trying to figure out everything, but they've got it basically up and running. There's also a large spray connected, they're coming out of a nozzle, connected to a pipeline that goes into one of the domes, and that's how we notified it. That's how we found it in the first place. We looked at the spray, which is clearly visible in the picture. And the remote viewers clearly described, yeah, the, the remote viewers described the whole thing. That's available for free on our website. Uh, they can actually watch that. It's called The Base on Mars. Great. Well, Dr. Brown, it was awesome having you on our show. We're definitely going to have you on again. Can't wait to hear your new work. Um, if you'll stick with us just a second after the close, that would be great. Sir, I want to thank you so much for inviting me back on. A very special thank you to our guest tonight. For all of you that had the opportunity to be here with us, if you enjoyed the show, follow us on YouTube, youtube.com slash clandestine time lord. For the most recent interviews, videos, and podcasts, or you can check us out on the World Wide Web, www.leakproject.com. Would you like to be a guest on our show? Do you have information that the world needs to see and hear? Send us an email, guestbookings at leakproject.com. Thank you, everybody. This is Rex Bear with Leak Project. Stay safe and be the change you want to see. Good night. <laughs>
being the leader and running the Farsight Institute, one of the most prestigious remote viewing institutes in the world, and having access to so much valid information. Yeah, it was a, a real great enigma for us because great many years ago, I was interested in another project that somehow wrapped Iapetus into it, and that started my strong interest in Iapetus. And that was the project that we did many years ago at the Farsight Institute on the origin of the asteroid belt. Now, the asteroid belt, the mainstream science explanation for it, is that it was created by the primordial solar nebula, which had a lot of junk that was left over, and it just condensed, and there was the asteroid belt. Now, that doesn't have a shred of evidence to support it. It's just a complete out of the clear blue sky set of ideas. And the alternate hypothesis is that it was created by a planet that was once there that exploded. Now, the reason the primordial nebula idea is so supported is that mainstream astronomers don't want to think about the idea that a planet could explode. So they support this solar nebula hypothesis and come up with all types of convoluted logic for how it happened. But in reality, there's not a shred of evidence to support it. And the logic is as crazy as you can think about it. Because, for example, the asteroids are made of these huge rocks, like the Ceres asteroid. I mean, they're huge, huge, huge rocks. You need a gravity well, a, a gravity source to pull a lot of dust together to produce a rock. You can't get a solid a big rock out of a lot of dust that's colliding in space from the primordial, primordial solar nebula. It has to condense first into a gravity well with a lot of pressure. And then also the rocks themselves, the asteroids, have evidence that they have been exposed to a tremendous amount of heat, a lot of surface glazing, melting. So... Thomas Van Flandern, uh, former head of his Department of Celestial, Manca Celestial Mechanics at the Naval Observatory, amassed a huge amount of planetary data supporting the exploding planet hypothesis, while mainstream science was supporting this crazy primordial solar nebula idea. And so we did a test with remote viewing using two different methodologies. That's controlled remote viewing. Uh, that's a formal methodology that taught by people like Lynn Buchanan, uh, and that came out, that the methodology came out of uh, the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, an official program in the U.S. military, and then we also used uh, remote viewers that were working with the Hawaii Remote Viewers Guild, led by Glenn Wheaton, who came out of Special Forces, and that method of remote viewing was uh, not out of an official program, but rather a movement within the military that later became known as the 1st Earth Battalion and was featured in the movie uh, Men Who Stare at Goats, starring Jeff Bridges and George Clooney. So we have these two different methodologies, a lot of remote viewers, and all of the remote viewing data under totally blind conditions. They were just told there was a target, remote view it, that supported the idea that there was a planet that exploded. Now, how did this wrap in Iapetus? Well, if there was a planet that exploded, one of the thoughts that Thomas Van Flandern had was that this big, dark splotch on the side of Iapetus was caused by a debris wave that traveled throughout the solar system when that planet exploded. And the debris wave hit Iapetus. Iapetus is a white, icy moon, and it's tidally locked, so it does not spin when it, wrote, when it orbits Saturn. It's, so it would have been held steady as the debris wave passed it, leaving a dark splotch. Now, mainstream science has a couple of ideas about how that dark splotch came about all of which are like dancing on the head of a pin. The logic is so convoluted, it's hard to begin. But the debris wave is very straightforward, and that's what Thomas Van Flandern thought, and so we included that in the asteroid, origin of the asteroid belt project. And sure enough, the debris wave was caused by the exploding planet that blew up, and this debris wave hit Iapetus, and that's what caused the dark splotch. So that was my original interest in Iapetus. And then also many years ago, I was looking at the Iapetus pictures that were available on the Internet, and some people on the Internet had uh, pointed out this strange thing on the side of a crater. And I looked closely at it, and I said, wow, that sure looks like a set of buildings. 
They had curved walls. Uh, had two. Had a, a bunch of very similar buildings, one after the other, and they had a flat circular top, uh, smooth sides that are curved, and what looked like steps coming out of the side uh, with a right angle to them. And they were way too big, far too big to actually be steps, but they looked like steps. So whatever they were, were artificial, it seems, from the picture. And this is a picture that was taken by the Cassini space probe sent up by NASA. And it's still there orbiting Saturn to this day, taking pictures. Now, there are much higher resolution pictures. They don't release those to the public. Uh, U.S. space satellites, for example, spy satellites have, have long been... What's that? Yeah. No, I didn't I mean to interrupt. Seen. I was just wondering if you've had the opportunity to see those high no, resolution I, I, photos. I don't have those. I don't have access to those pictures. But I know they exist because space spy satellites can have long, have, many, have a great many decades, been able to read the label on a baseball from hundreds of miles in space. So the, right. the resolution is, is quite clear from those cameras. And, but nonetheless, the ones that they did release to the public are, were good enough to see this thing. So I said to myself many years ago that I would like to examine what that is if ever given a chance. And so, well... It's a strange story because the remote viewers that I work with now are predominantly the very best on the planet. People like Dick Algaier, who came out of the Hawaii Remote Viewers Guild using the HRVG method, and Daz Smith, who uses the CRV method, coming that uh, came out of the, the Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA. And uh, those people really have a desire and interest in getting their art form accepted by mainstream. And they've often not wanted to add extra woo-woo elements to it, such as extra extraterrestrial targets. So I often avoided extraterrestrial targets for many years. But this is an opportunity where I sort of said, well, this is, this is got to, I got to break this eventually. So eventually I just told them we have a new project, do it. They did it under totally blind conditions, not expecting anything extraterrestrial. And I included three extraterrestrial targets in one project. And the first one was the so-called base on Mars in Cydonia. And that was really interesting because we figured out what that whole thing was. And the second target was this anomaly, this thing that looked like a facility or a set of structures on the inside wall of a crater of Iapetus, which was very clear on the pictures. And the third one was the Phoenix Lights, the famous incident of the Phoenix Lights. And that will be coming out in video form in um, July, but the Iapetus one is like fresh off the presses. It's only been out a week. And that's really tremendously uh, tremendously interesting from our, from our perspective. So that's how I got interested in this. And uh, the, I, we, we found out now what that facility is, and it was the biggest surprise to all of us. You see, with something like a space facility, Normally, you think of an extraterrestrial spy base, a uh, military facility. Uh, perhaps you think in terms of a mining operation. But this was none of that. This was something I've never heard anybody talk about ever. This was the craziest thing we'd ever experienced. And no, and no one could have predicted it. No one could have planned it. And you really have to see the remote viewing yourself to appreciate how amazing and weird this thing is. So what we do now is for the last, for quite a few years now, we don't do paper and pen sessions anymore like they used in the military. Uh, we use those basically just for warm-up exercises. But we do all of the remote viewing standing up, live, recorded on video. And so Dad Smith and Dick Elgar were totally blind. They were in their own homes, uh, setting up their own camera equipment, their own audio equipment, and we've gotten really good at producing really first-rate videos about this so the audience can actually see the remote viewing going live. And the remote viewers had to learn not only how to do it standing up in front of whiteboards, but how to do it in a theatrically engaging, interactive manner. And they are spectacular. Uh, Daz Smith and Dick Elgeyer are one of a kind, and to be able to work with them is just unbelievable. So they did all of that, and they came in with 
pretty much duplicate data because they're both that good. Their data always corroborate one another. And they don't have any communication between them during the time that the remote viewing is going on. And the only thing they were ever told is a non-leading email saying that there is a target and they should remote view it. So it's amazing how accurate these data are. So there are, there are verifiable elements, and then there are new elements for this target. So for this target, the thing, you have a nice picture of it. Uh, the verifiable elements is that it's on an icy moon of Saturn. <laughs> so it's a very barren, rocky landscape with absolutely no foliage, uh, no air, and it's on the inside of a crater. Rocky mountains all over the place. So that's very verifiable. And so we expect the remote viewers to perceive that and come back with that. And they did it in spades. I mean, it was incredible to watch that stuff when you see them describe the verifiable elements so perfectly without a glitch. And then they noticed the thing, the set of buildings on the wall of the crater. And that's what they called it. They said, there's a crater, there's a wall on the crater, and there's a set of buildings over there. And that was surprising to them. Uh, They were able to figure out that it was off-world. They put it all together, all under totally blind conditions. And then they described it. So, Rex, uh, we'll, we'll get into the details as we go along. But let me just tell people that if they want to see the actual video, the live video, which is to die for, I mean, it's just unbelievably interesting. The best way to do it is to just go to our website at uh, www.farsight, and that's F-A-R-S-I-G-H-T, like seeing far, dot org, O-R-G, because we're a nonprofit. And just to click on the thing at the top saying about the this thing and you can just see the videos and actually watch the entire project. But uh, we'll get to the details as we go on, but let me just tell you that the facility with no 